In this episode, my guest is James, who's an indie founder trying to figure out how to make money online while doing things that he enjoys. He runs PodPanda, which is a podcast production studio. He also hosts Indie Bytes, which is a podcast where he, he hosts other indie founders and he talks to them about their business. And he has a few other revenue streams. In the episode, we talk quite a lot about indie founders. We talk about burnout also and uh, just mental health and well-being among founders because he struggled with burnout and he explains his story and his situation. Uh, we talk about podcasting also because we're both podcasters, so we touch on that topic quite a bit. And in the end, he also shares the top five books that affected his business and life the most. So if that's something that you like, I hope you're going to enjoy the episode. And if you do, please share, subscribe, like, or share, uh, send me a message on Twitter and let me know what you think. Thanks, and I hope you enjoyed the episode. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit weird in that sense too. Okay, so there's all these tricks that I hope we're going to talk about also in general in the episode. But just to make it the official start, James, welcome to the Founders Lounge. Thank you for having me, Mattis. Absolutely, a pleasure. So, James, I think we're going to talk about a few different things today. Um, but maybe to start the episode, um, can you just do a quick introduction of who you are, what you work on? And then I think we might work on, we might, because you do a bunch of different things and many of them are quite interesting. So I think we'll, we'll touch on a few different topics today. But yeah, how would you introduce yourself? Yeah, I do do quite a few things and I'm actually working on making it less or spending my time specifically on a few bigger things as opposed to having my time split between a lot of little things. So my main project, my main income is through a podcast editing service called Podpanda, where I edit podcasts for clients. Um, then I also have a podcast called Indie Bites, which is what I call my main side project. If it was like two things I could keep, it would just be the podcast editing service and Indie Bites. Those are the things where I think I'll put most focus in. Uh, and then I've got a few other things on the side. I've got um, my handmade wallet business, which is completely different to everything else. But I love making things with my hands. Uh, discovered it through leather, leather craft and leather making. <laughs> And it's kind of interesting to do something completely different and completely away from podcasting and software. Then I also have a course where I teach people how to do a podcast, start a podcast in two hours or less time commitment a week. And I think that's most of the stuff I do. I also dabble in YouTube. I've got a few YouTube channels. Um, but those are the main things I can think of. Have I missed anything? This episode is sponsored by Freelancer.com, the largest online marketplace for freelancing and crowdsourcing. If you want to delegate some of your work or need to hire an expert to work on virtually anything with any skill, then this is the place for you. They've got over 60 million registered freelancers, so you can find pretty much anyone who would do anything you want. Even NASA has been using it for years, and I've been using it recently to get some cool new stuff done for the podcast. So if you want to give it a try, go to freelancer.tflpod.co and you'll get a 30 pound voucher to start with your first project. So that's freelancer tflpod.co i'll put the link in the description well i don't know if i'm the right person to ask <laughs> i did do a little bit of research on you and i think that that covers yes that covers everything that i could find yeah. so you're doing a few different things um but you want to simplify to less um and we're going to talk about that later because i want to talk about that as well why you want to simplify but first why do you do so many things then yeah, it was initially wanting to like diversify my income. So uh -huh. having lots of different things. So if one thing fails, then I can have backups from the yes. other sources of income, which does have its merits. And the other thing is with lots of different interests and as an entrepreneur, you're always having ideas. You're always wanting to start new things. You feel like you can start new things. No one's telling you not to. Um, so you just sort of explore curiosities. And there's a lot to be said on both sides of having uh, multiple projects um, that you have multiple revenue streams and there's the benefits of that, de-risking yourself. Daniel Vasalo is a guy that talks a lot about having this mm -hmm. portfolio of small bets. Then you've got the other end of the spectrum, which is having a single pure focus, which actually over the past few months, the more I've been talking to people who have done one or the other, it seems that having, well, depending on what your goals are, having a focus, like a single focus, does end up 
um, garnering better results. Mm. But it, it entirely depends on your goals. If you want to explore different things or you get bored easily and you don't want to focus on one thing, then have multiple things. Mm. But it just means each one of those things won't grow as fast as if you focus on one single thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I think about that quite a bit because we talked about before we started recording, right? We talked about that. I, I have a few different projects that I work on and that just, that's just my personality. I just love working on different things at the same time. Um, if I focus just on one thing, I kind of get bored. It's like, well, I don't, I don't want to think about just one thing. I, I just need more things. And as you said, more interest, you know, you want to try this and you want to try a little bit of that. Um, and I think, so I've been thinking about that a lot because the, the frequent advice that you hear is focus, right? You need to focus on one thing. There's like one big thing, put all your effort, all your time into that. Um, but the more people I talk to, it just seems to depend on your personality as well. I think, yes, if you only chase a unicorn kind of startup, which is not something that I want to do at the moment, um, I think you probably should focus just on when, that one thing because it's really hard and the competition is enormous and you know the growth is huge there's new problems coming up every single day and so on then you probably should focus just on one thing um but otherwise it tends to you know there, there are several people who just juggle multiple things at the same time or at least what i what i see a lot of people are doing is that in the beginning when it's the project is yeah. in an early stage they focus on one thing right and then you try to systemize that or like optimize it to some extent and then you move on to the next thing right yeah, personalities and goals. So I would ask you, like, what are your goals with your projects? Good question. I think th there's a little bit of both. So one is one is just exploring. I think one thing that I like to do, and specifically the podcast, like a podcast is a project that takes a little bit of time and, you know, it costs a little bit of money and it doesn't generate any revenue at the moment, although it, it might, um, but it's just an opportunity to do something interesting and to meet interesting people and mm -hmm. somebody i don't know who was it who talked about the was it the luck surface area or something mm -hmm. like that that the more you know you, you can have more luck in life if, if you create opportunity for luck and for me the podcast is increasing my luck surface area right it's just meeting new people having interesting conversations and then magic happened. I've, everything interesting that happened to me in life was because I met this one person and then we did something crazy or something interesting or something meaningful or something that made money together, right? Um, uh, Matty's podcasting has been like the single most influential thing that has ever happened in my life um, in terms of the people I've been able to meet through having a podcast the conversations it facilitates the people i'm now able to have conversations with who have turned into friends and clients exactly. would not have been possible without yeah. podcasting it's helped me with speaking it's helped me articulate yes. my thoughts better exactly. um, it's helped me become a better conversationalist even down the pub um which is yes. important uh, and so that's all come from podcasting yeah, it's definitely, I realized it's helping to ask better questions in general, because you're more, when you're on the on the podcast, you're more thoughtful about the questions that you ask, right? You, you, you want to create good content, you want to be good, uh, uh, you want to have a good conversation. And I, in real life, I became better at asking questions. And another thing that I was not expecting is also, I started to care less what other people think, because <laughs> if you start creating content, and you put that content out there, you just cannot like you cannot think about every you know about every episode oh my god is this good what are they, you know what, what have, what's everyone going to think about it? it it just yeah that was there for the first few episodes and now it just it's not part of what i think about anymore which is great which is it's just such a um great kind of personal growth uh side effect <laughs> from mm -hmm. podcasting i got a little sidetrack there but I, back to the thing about single focus multiple projects you say your goal like the you've said like the benefits podcasting has given you and you you want to it suits your personality but do you want to grow your side projects into something that makes money do you just want to keep them side projects because for me like my goal it, my short-term goal is to increase my income i want to get to 10k a month and the most direct route for me to do that is through the podcast editing service 
Mm-hmm. My long-term goal is not to be editing people's podcast. My long-term goal is to do my own podcast. I want Indie Bites to be its own standalone thing because I really enjoy having the conversations, the people I meet, uh, producing the show is good fun. Um, and within that, I can almost have little side projects. I can build out the membership. Um, I can build the sponsor program out. So there's just more I can do within that one project. And that's where like the argument against a single project will be boring um, mm. comes in because your single focus project, you can have little projects in between them or you're always excited about the stuff you're building, new features, new marketing strategies, uh, all of which can be um, like part of one thing, but also stops you from being bored. Yeah. Yeah, I think, what, was that a question for me? Yeah, the question was like, <laughs> what what is your goal with with your projects? Yeah, yeah, I think in the beginning, the, the goal with the podcast was never to grow it. It was always just, oh, let's just do this. Partially it's fun, partially I get to meet interesting people and that's great. And then we actually, so to give you a little bit of a background story, right? The way how this podcast started was, we it was me and my friend who just started recording our business brainstorming conversations about ideas, conversations about interesting businesses that we saw. And we started recording that, putting it out there, and it actually got quite a lot of traction. And we started doing that in Slovenia. I'm originally from Slovenia, and he is as well. And we were actually, we started publishing it as a podcast, and we were the top three business podcasts in Slovenia for the, pretty much the whole first year. And we're like, wow, okay, well, that's interesting. That, that makes it more fun, right? Because you get a little bit of success and you get a little bit of recognition. It's like, oh, wow, okay, so... We must be doing something right. Um, eventually, he got kind of bored of it. He's got other things to do as well. So for whatever reason, he didn't want to do it anymore. And I was like, well, I still find it interesting, but I'll just switch to English because, yeah. you know, I live in the UK. Um, I, for me, it's more interesting to have conversations with people who are here. So I switched over to English. Obviously, a very different story, right? Because it's English-speaking market. The much, much more competition. Um, very, very different story. So... Um, but we did get some traction. So I was like, well, and another good news, I actually just today, I had a conversation with somebody who wants to be the first sponsor. So it's going to be like a experimental first sponsor, um, just to cover the costs. So not to generate any profit, but just to cover the costs that we have with, uh, production and so on. Um, so that's a little bit something over there. Um, do I want it to ever be a massive source of income? I mean... I wouldn't complain, but it's not part of my plan right now. I think the we're chasing growth to an extent, uh, but it's more just because it's fun. And I think if you're, you know, if you're entrepreneurial, you always want to, it's like, oh, okay, we got a little bit something, but we can do more and we can do more and we can do more. And then obviously growing also helps you get better guests and it just creates new and more opportunities, right? So that's kind of where I am right now. So you had a full-time job until about a year ago or so yeah oh or it was oh i forget the time uh <laughs> I, I reckon it was longer uh yeah april the, the my final month was april 2021 and i went part-time at the start of the year so yeah it's been a year and a bit where i've been mm-hmm. full-time on my own projects and i was sort of part-time job from the start of 2021 so it mm. sort of went in phases lockdown or covid was working full time felt i had more time to do my side projects started getting a little bit more traction with them and then um and then like went part time and sort of saw if i could make the income work and it uh, it didn't really work out fully that way because of mental health. I don't know if you want to get into that because that's something that's quite important to me. Uh, Let's get into that. Yeah. um, I've really struggled with mental health ever since COVID, the lockdown. I moved into my own place in sort of October 2020. This is when I still had the full-time job um, and I moved in on my own and I'd lived with either family or housemates before. And where we had that isolation where I couldn't really go out and do things, I felt very Mm. lonely. And I was overworking. I had a full-time job plus all my side projects and freelance gigs. It was way too much work, Matthews. Way too much. And Mm. I burnt out. I felt low. I felt depressed. Um, Worst feeling of my life. Uh, It was really horrible. Uh, To the point where 
Mm-hmm. And I was reluctant to say, oh, yeah, I, I had this planned. I went part time. I went part time because I had too much work and I, I wanted to change something. And I thought if I did my freelance work and focused on that fully and reduced my uh, my day job, I would feel better. Truth is, that didn't happen. That's why I left, um, because the uh, it was still too much. And because of what had happened in that October, September 2020 time, I just wasn't myself. And you know what? Still not myself. I've had months where I felt good. I've had months where I felt terrible. Like the majority of the time I've still felt terrible. And what does that mean? It means I wake up and I don't feel like doing anything. Days go by where I just sort of stare at my screen or uh, I lay in bed and don't feel like getting up and getting frustrated at myself and James, you're lazy. Come on, get up. But it goes a bit deeper than that. Um, and the times where I felt really good, there was a particular time at the start of this year where I felt great. I had a new bit of energy and I was happy that like the, the depression had been put at bay. I felt good. I was waking up, doing my work, making progress with my projects. Um, and then a few months ago, it just sort of hit me again. So I've been sort of battling through it where I'm not my usual productive self or myself that I was before the pandemic happened and all the change happened. Um, uh, and I have to be careful with how I spend my time and making sure I'm taking time off, not working mm. weekends, um, just switching off. When you're an entrepreneur, you are on all the time, seven days mm-hmm. a week, and you've got to find a way to switch off at some point, whether that is taking a holiday where you completely switch off and you just go, look, I've got to accept that my laptop is staying away and uh, things might go wrong with clients or something, and you've just got to save yourself a little bit. So, yeah. Wow. It's, it's, I mean, burnout is a, it's a real thing, right? And especially among founders and especially, yes, if you're, you know, very driven and you, you want to do all these things and there's a lot of pressure that comes with it and so on. You so never I, notice I could... it in the moment because you're really enjoying working on your thing. And that is exactly how I felt at the start of this year. I was so excited. I was doing loads of Indie Bytes episodes. I was increasing revenue for my uh, podcast service. I was selling a bunch of wallets. I was feeling great. I was like, I want to work 12-hour days every day. I don't want to take a break because I'm just enjoying this productivity. And because of how the last couple of years have gone, I'm just going to enjoy this time of pure productivity. And I I was sort of in the back of my mind, I was thinking, but James, remember what happened before when you were working like this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, it's different this time because it's on my own stuff purely. And, uh, uh, and it wasn't, it was, I was just edging towards burnout and not realizing it. Um, there weren't any signs of it happening. It was just one day I was working really hard for three weeks in a row without a break. Then the next day, I didn't feel like doing anything. And it was the weirdest feeling. It was so bizarre because I'd had such a good, productive, successful last couple of months. And then I wake up one day just without any energy or motivation. um, And I was like, I've overdone it. I should have, I should have noticed it in that time and taken weekends off or picked a day in the week to be fully off. And I don't touch any work. Um, So, yeah. What, so you touched on it a little bit, but what do you think, is there a way or, or what is the best way to actually notice when that is happening? You said that you don't really notice it. So I don't know if there's any way to elaborate on that. Yeah, That's my, uh, yeah. I mean, if, if you're working that hard, it is unsustainable. Um, Mm. I, uh, there are some people that may be able to do it fine, but I know for me, and many others, if you're working seven days a week, eight to 10 hours a day, you're going to burn out. You really are because you don't have that time to decompress. You don't have that time off. You may be enjoying it in the moment, but it is it can go so quickly. Um, mm-hmm. And I was someone who had never dealt with mental health challenges before what happened in the last couple of years. And I didn't really understand it. Some of my family members had, and I said, oh, you just just sort of snap out of it. And it was the worst possible thought I could have had because it is not a case of snapping out of it. Um, so if you're working really hard, maybe you're 
extreme you're doing 14 hours a day just make sure you realize what you're doing and take a day or two's break every week mm. go and do some fun stuff uh in the last year or so i've been trying to find the stuff that really truly gives me joy and happiness that isn't revolve around work i'm not trying to make money from i'm just doing it purely for leisure and fun uh, those things have been tennis tennis has been so much fun for me i'm not trying to monetize that um <laughs> riding my motorbike has been terrific fun uh -huh. it's exploration uh, -huh. uh it's meditative uh it's fun um other sports going to coffee shops just sort of wandering down into my city and sitting in a coffee shop reading all of these things are just leisure it's away from work and if you can do more of these activities the chances that you won't burn out uh, are much higher um mm. i was gonna ask you what what someone can do to help prevent that as much as possible but i think you more or less answered that already um i'll i'll add and i'm not very good at this right but w there are a few things that really helped me and one is <laughs> being in a relationship as much as I would say that I actually struggled with that in the past because a relationship was often something that prevented me from work, working more. And I was like, I don't have time for this. But now I really shifted my, because I see people yeah. burning out and I see my friends, uh, you know, struggling with either burnout or depression. I'm like, I really, I tend to be the kind of person who really tries hard to prevent the worst things from happening. I'm like, I really need to be careful, right? Be careful what I'm doing. And being in a relationship helps because you have somebody who you kind of have to hang out with them, right? I mean, and you hopefully enjoy it, not just that you have to, it's 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 pleasant. Um, the other two things that I really, really like is one is sauna. Going to a sauna for me is like mm. micro holiday. It's like the most relaxed thing possible. And you're there for two or three hours. You have no access to your phone. Well, hopefully not, hopefully you live it outside. And it's just you and your thoughts. And I don't know, just that, change up from hot to cold and relaxed music. It's extremely rela relaxing. Uh, the other thing that I love is go-karts. Yeah. Because you are in the zone, right? You're there. It's, it's competitive, but you are so, your mind is just occupied with racing and you, you, you take away your mind from everything else that hap that's happening in your life. And it's also, it's like a, like a restart of your mind, right? It's like when, when something's wrong with your laptop, you restart it, you, you kind of do a reset. Going, to, going, uh, go-kart racing for me, it's, it's similar. It's like a reset, um, where I forget about everything You're else. So right. That is a great example. You need to find for you what go-karting is to Matisse. Um, uh, yeah. motorbike riding is a little bit similar because mm. if you make a wrong mm. turn, you'll die. And that keeps you on edge. And so you're very focused. And one thing I yeah. tried literally this weekend. In fact, there was two things I tried this weekend, which are very nice. First of which was Lego. I've never done Lego huh. before in my life. And I thought, let me go and buy a Lego set. So I bought it and see if I enjoyed it. And what was fascinating about doing this Lego was that it retained my focus for three hours, like three hours completely straight. Huh. I hadn't had that much focus in anything in months, maybe even years, but I was just completely focused in putting these little blocks together. Um, and I loved it. My mind wasn't elsewhere. It was just focused on building these blocks. I was with my little sister. She was building a set as well. So we were chatting and it was just a lovely time. I was not thinking about work. And if I can create more of those moments in my life, it's going to really benefit my, mm. uh, my work. And ultimately, I want to be successful. I'm driven to succeed in my business. Um, I want to make an impact. And for that, my mind needs to be better. Uh, and so I need to find these moments and not work every single hour of every day. Because what will then happen is I'll explode like I have done and won't publish an episode of my podcast for two months mm. or miss client deadlines. Mm. Um, so finding Lego uh, or go-karting or motorbiking for yourself. The other thing I tried, have you ever tried kayaking, Matisse? No, I have not, no. Just randomly saw a sign that said kayak hire as I was driving uh -huh. somewhere the other day. And I was like, that seems interesting. And when I got to my destination, I checked my phone and had a little look for this kayak hire. It was £20 for an hour. And I thought, well, on my way back, why don't I just go for an hour kayak and see what it's like 
And so on my way back, drove past the sign, went in, uh, hired a kayak, said I've never done this before. They said, you'll love it. And I just went out in the water and it was so peaceful. What a lovely thing to do. Um, I just had my paddle, my boat, and it was on a little river in, in Canterbury. And I went out for 20, 25 minutes, back for 35. It was joyous. It was just, mm. I wasn't on my phone. I didn't have any screens. I was just in mm. nature, watching the swans, the ducks, dragonflies. And I was like, this is tranquil. I need to find more of this stuff and put that into uh, my life. So I come back feeling refreshed. Mm. Wow. Well, that's a good one. I haven't tried that. That's, have you done uh, Lego? Uh, not since I was 12. <laughs> <probably>. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. yeah. I, I, these what these sets are like for adults and uh, i don't think yeah, yeah. Old me would have been able to do it Let, i'll show you i got it here. <laughs> no I, I i can imagine i just i have absolutely not tried it since i'm an adult yeah oh wow that looks really cool i've got the blurry thing so you can't really see it but this is yeah this is new york yeah i see new york yeah nice Okay, so that's that's a few ideas there to try. But yeah, the important thing is that you find something that you just intrinsically enjoy, yeah. right? And you that you actually prioritize doing that in your life, right? Yeah, because um, you're probably like me as well, and... where you try and monetize everything. Like every new mm. hobby you have, you're like, oh, how can I make a business out of that? And uh, the, the saying like, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life is bullshit. Because if you start making money from the stuff that you love, you end up hating it. So when I was younger, mm, I loved making yeah. videos, YouTube videos and uh, other anything with a camera. I loved, like genuinely loved. I'm going to do it in my spare time. As soon as I started earning money from it, like different dynamics were at play where I had a client who wanted videos yeah. to be made the way they wanted to and it just made me hate it. So that's how I feel about yeah. that thing. Yeah, I've heard about that before. I've heard from from other people. Yeah, um, it's it's all. I don't know. I think there are conflicting opinions about that as well. Uh, there are some people who are still just like, yeah, I just I just love what I do, and that's the only reason why I can keep doing it. But I've heard, what you? I don't have. I don't know if I have a personal opinion or experience on that specifically. But um, I suppose this is the other beauty, right, things. Matisse? Like ev everyone is different. Everyone has different exactly. experiences. Exactly. Everyone has different approaches to business. Like you can listen to advice from two completely separate people. You've got like the multiple projects people and the single focus. They've both like got to the same point, but they've gone completely different routes. And they'll like be very, very strong, strongly opinionated on their route. But your job mm. as a human is to look at these different ways that people have got to where you want to be and figure yeah. out what's the best route for you. Try different things because people work in different ways some people like running 100 miles on the weekend i do not i like to ride my motorbike um so that, like people are wired in different way so um some people might enjoy things that i'm saying like work for me they might not work for you yeah yeah exactly i think it's important to explore and try different things and figure out for yourself right what what works what doesn't um you, okay, so you mentioned your podcast a few times, and that's I think on the podcast you kind of you're interviewing people who are doing things a little bit similar to yourself, right? So you you the podcast is called Indie Bites, and you talk to indie founders, right? Indie founders, fifteen minute conversations, yeah. Uh huh. What and you had some pretty successful people on there, like you mentioned. Uh, what's his name again? Vasalo. Daniel uh, Vasalo, yeah. Daniel Vasalo, he's making loads of money with his single person business i believe um probably many others how what's um do you have any highlights to share so everyone on your podcast kind of follows the scenario of an indie founder i believe so they're they're one person business and they have one or more kind of products that they sell sometimes it's tech products sometimes it's online courses often it's a combination of all those things am i getting that right i'm just kind of guessing based on my knowledge of the indie founder yeah. community that's an interesting view um uh, indie founders don't need to like be solo founders uh there's a, right. a lot okay, of people yeah. like are inspired by solo founders because they might not have found a co-founder or they want to um just 
do everything themselves. I like being a solo founder. Um, but I speak to people that have co-founders that have built quite big bootstrap businesses. Uh, often, mm-hmm. like the main thing is you, you don't usually raise funding. But more recently, mm-hmm. I've been speaking to people that have raised funding. So it's it's more just people who have made businesses the non-traditional way or the non-big VC route. And even those that have done big VC, I'm kind of interested to speak to them because they've got an interesting mm. viewpoint of why they did what they did. There are some people that I speak to who have done um, like VC in the past and now they're indie or maybe they've gone the yeah. other way around. Um, yeah. And you say highlights, let me think. So the founder of Indie Hackers, Cortland Allen, was uh, yeah. quite early on in the pod and he's been a great mentor for me with the show. Um, my friend Saba, uh, who runs a company called V.io, uh, they, yeah. uh, I, I met him at a pub a few years ago. Loveliest chap, like honestly, the most genuine, nice guy. Uh, they bootstrapped to about six million, and then they raised thirty-five million from Sequoia. Um, wow. So wow. Uh, I, I would still consider Saba an indie friend. I'd still have him on the podcast as a guest because he's got so much to learn, and I'm also interested in his viewpoint of why he went from bootstrapping to raising like he was fully indie and then yeah. decided to raise and having had conversations with him it's because like he felt there was more to do with V. like he he felt like there was more to unlock with um with their product and with their team and i thought well it's... the product is a vi i think hmm? uh, it's a, like the online video editing yeah software, video editing right? software yeah yeah and um, but like uh, all of my guests have been awesome a lot of them have become uh, like lifelong friends Arvid Carl runs a com well, it, he did run a company called Feedback Panda. Uh, he grew that to about 60k a year and then sold it. And now he writes about bootstrapping with his blog, The Bootstrap mm-hmm. Founder. He's got a cool, a cool couple of blogs. Um, who else did I spoke to you that I really enjoyed? Oh, Justin Jackson runs a company called Transistor FM, uh-huh. uh, which is a podcast host. It's the host that I use. Um, they are a great indie success story. So they're a very small team. Mm-hmm. There's two of them. And Justin is like a bootstrapping veteran. He's been around the block. Um, I've heard about him. And yeah. now, he's a, now he's a good friend. Um, let's see, is there anyone else that... Uh, there's one while you're thinking if you have anyone else to highlight um there's one example that came to mind um which well obviously i've, I've talked about peter levels on the mm. podcast before so he's obviously on the kind of like the star among indie founders but then there's another sort of star but he's i think way less known is his name aj or everyone just knows him as aj the founder of yeah, card yeah, right the the page builder yeah. which was fascinating when i found that business and when i found him that was insane to me it's like it's a, the simplest possible page builder all you can do is you can do one pagers it's super super simple nothing complex but he was i don't remember but he's not, the number of users that he had was insane well, like two, three years into the business, never took on any funding. Um, again, the product was really simple. I remember I asked him at some point, I was like, what's your marketing strategy? How do you get all these all these users? And he's like, I don't know. I just tweet about it sometimes. I'm like, okay, that's a, <laughs> that's great to know. That doesn't tend to work for me, but <laughs> I'm happy it works for you. And then he's also an example of someone who went on to raise funding, yeah, eventually, yeah. Right? I think recently or like a year ago or so. So through doing the podcast, one of the best things about it has been listening to how or learning how certain founders have uh, got traction or grown these frankly huge indie businesses they've completely changed their lives for the better financially mm-hmm. um <laughs> freedom wise they have completely changed their lives uh, and they've all got it through slightly different ways but like one key thing is product is king right you, you if you have a bad product and great marketing you're gonna really struggle if you think well um so like aj is such a good example because his product is so good and it mm. really solves a problem in the market of i want to uh, spin up a web page and he's priced it so competitively that it's almost a no-brainer purchase so mm-hmm. his product being so good with the like product leg growth um, has meant as soon as he's got traction with it, people have realized the value they're getting from the product and have shared it and it's gone viral that way. He's also got the domains, uh, like the subdomains, and he's grown that way. 
and so if you have a good product it is going to grow please don't just expect that if you put a load of marketing dollars into your product that it's going to grow um another great example of a story that's quite inspiring my friend brett um who runs a productized service a design one called design joy he grew it to 130,000 oh, yeah, mrr monthly recurring revenue monthly, solo yeah it's absolutely yeah. bonkers it's insane um and, and it just <laughs> goes to show you what's possible with this right but how is that actually possible so i've heard about him and but i don't know a lot about his story and it's just like that amount of mrr as a service business as a single person it's Incredible. Yeah, well, he, he's explained a lot about how he manages it. I, I, do you mean, like, how has he got to that point or how does he manage having that much? How does he manage? Because it, it means either you're charging a lot or you have an insane amount of work or you somehow manage to build a system where, like, work, yeah. I don't know, somehow gets done. Yeah, um, he, he works really quick. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, he, he was telling me about how he had this, like, Tumblr quote blog that he was he made like 70,000 images for over a few years so he certainly got work ethic right um so he can pump out designs he's really fast he's really good um but what people don't see is he's, he's really struggled with the amount of work that he's had to do for it um and he, he's like tried to take on help but uh probably very similar to me like ha has a certain level he wants to get to um with designs it was not quite there he wants control over it um so yeah he struggled with burnout and like trying to manage all of this and he's recently scaled it back a lot um because he's just taken on too much for himself but it's very mm. hard when you get to that point and people keep paying you your waiting list goes bigger he opened up like uh calls for silly amounts an hour and they all got booked up it's very hard when numbers keep going up and up and people keep giving you money to stop doing it and you just want to do more and more and more. So it's almost, it's like a great success story, but a little bit of a warning sign, mm. um, right? If you mm. get to that size, because do you really need to get as a solo person to a hundred thousand dollars a month? Really? I mean, that's, it's pretty cool, but um, it's like a one person business. Uh, I know for me, I'm aiming for about, 20 to 25k a month because i think that will be a really nice amount where i'm not worried about money my whole life matters mm. i've been really struggling with money and i still do uh i don't have like recurring revenue at the moment well i have a little bit but it's not notable enough and um like my income is just all over the place especially since i left my job um bills bouncing not being able to predict when money is coming in um if i got mm. to 25k that would be a nice amount where I wouldn't be thinking about it and I'd pay off my debts. Yeah. 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 hundred. Well, a hundred K is especially uh, a challenge. I think, especially if it's a service based business, right? Because he can't like Peter levels, he's got products, yeah. right? So he just like, he's Peter levels is doing like 2.7 million based on the last numbers and in revenue of uh, almost all of that is profit as well. But it's, it's a product. It's a thing that just kind of runs, right? If he disappears for a month, it's like, it's going to be a very small problem. He's like, yeah, maybe, maybe something is going to break, uh, whatever, but nothing major is going to go wrong. Uh, with service-based business, that's trickier because, yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody actually needs to be there and deliver that service, right? Yeah, I mean, Peter Levels is a, uh, like a, a very unique example. Um, he started really early. Mm. Uh, he's got a great product. He's got a very unique view on indie hacking and on life in general um and yeah he's done great with his products uh there's other people that have done the same i i also like speaking to people that haven't been as successful right and they're still in the weeds trying to figure it out because that is most people um and there's some mm -hmm. people have maybe got to one or two k a month with their products and they're really interesting to see yeah. how they've got to that point because typically people yeah. struggle to get over like the one k mark they're like Yes, that's like exactly that's yeah. validation that you've got something there that's working if people give you enough money to the tune of a thousand pound a month um a thousand dollars a month sorry um so those people are interesting how did you get to that point um it's usually a lot of failures like a lot of trying things and hmm. it not working out which is kind of where the multiple projects comes in right if you have lots of different things you're trying them yeah but 
I also think if you're not putting your full effort into each one of those things, how can you really know if one of those is going to be successful? Yeah, see, that's a good question. I think about it sometimes. Where, when is the, like, what is the right amount of effort? Or when should you say, okay, this is working yeah. or this is not working? Well, you know when it's working. The question is more like when, when should you say this is not uh -huh. working, right? Um, I think to an extent it just comes with practice. Um, practice, what do you mean? I think... As in, I think you just need to develop that gut feeling for it, which I'm not saying that I yeah. have it already, but... How, how do you develop I, I that gut feeling develop having it. done it before? No, you just have to do it. <laughs> you just have to keep doing it. That's the only way. That's the only way when you can feel... Because it's a question that I also quite often ask on the podcast. I'm like, how, you know, with people who have either launched multiple products or had several businesses in the past, I'm like, so how do you decide? Especially it's interesting with people who just who have... A, maybe an e-commerce brand that they launch multiple products, mm. right? Um, and they want to test things before they actually go into a full kind of production or whatever it is. How do you test? How do you know what works? Or when you're, maybe when you're entering a new market, right? So often e-commerce, um, you know, e-commerce entrepreneurs around Europe, um, you enter a new market, right? You go from, for example, I had uh, uh, e-com entrepreneurs from Slovenia and then they enter Italy and Germany and France and some markets work and some markets don't, right? It's like, how do you know, how, when do you, how do you decide what works and what doesn't? When, she, when do you want to say, okay, yeah, well, that, clearly that, not working That's a little us. bit easier, right? Because you, you have your baseline of one market. Like in Slovenia, you've got, okay, so here's yeah. what's, here is success or perceived success. And in Italy, uh, how close to that can we get, for instance? Whereas when you've got multiple projects, yeah. I, I struggle to know. I struggle to think, how will you know if you're not putting the effort to give it time to show that it's going to work or not? If you're just putting, if you've got five projects and you're putting 20% of time into each of them, how do you know that each one of them is going to, if you're just putting 20% of effort in, rather than if I put 100% of effort into something? And Matic, my, my my viewpoint on this has changed over the past few months, the more conversations I've had with people. And it does make a lot more sense now. Although I still have multiple projects, I'm trying to think I probably need to focus on the podcast editing mm -hmm. because right now that is like the clearest mm -hmm. route to my goal, my short-term goal at least, which is to sort my money situation out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. I mean, that's why I think it's good to, if you want to do multiple things, you focus on one thing at a time, on on uh, one thing at a time in a way, right? And you, you try to get that to a certain point or you say, okay, this this makes no sense anymore to pursue. Um, and then, or, or you say, okay, that's sort of passive at this point. Now I can focus on the next thing. Um, but yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's always interesting. Um, podcast. So let, let's talk about podca podcasts mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, so with your business, you do editing, or what? What's our old? What's the the full service? What do yeah, you offer? Probably similar to producer Tom in here. Uh, I do editing, uh, which is just you record the files, I edit, and then send you the the fully uh, produced file or for some of my clients, I do similar production where it's, I will put the guests in for you, um, record with you, set you up with a microphone, make it all, make sure it sounds okay. We usually send a microphone to guests as well to make sure it all sounds good. Uh -huh. um, and then edit and publish, write show notes, transcripts, that sort of thing. So it's sort of the start to finish, uh, low touch for the host where they just have to show up and record. Um, maybe do some notes, maybe a quick briefing on it, and then producer handles the rest. So producer is a service for mm -hmm. podcasts. Then there's also a service where I help people start their podcasts. So many people want to start a podcast, they don't know how or where to. Um, I'll just help you through that. Uh, coming up with your format, your idea even. Some people would just think, I want a podcast, I don't know where to start. So help you find your format, idea, uh, branding, art, publishing. Okay, great. And do you, so you had Indie Bytes first and it, that your service business then kind of started as a result of that? You said, okay, I'm doing podcasting. I kind of know how I do this. Yeah, so I, I've done podcasting for like four or five years now. 
um had my own <laughs> podcast uh, my own po- i had another podcast called marketing mashup which was when i worked at a marketing mm-hmm. agency before um where i spoke to mostly marketing people this is when i was destined for a career in marketing before i read the book company of one and completely changed my mindset of what i wanted to do but on the side i was always doing video freelancing i mentioned video earlier it was always my passion um and i wanted to be a videographer build a video marketing agency and then when covid happened all my video clients uh dried up and I was like, well, I've got a lot of transferable skills from video client work to podcasting client work. More people are starting podcasts. There was like a million podcasts started during COVID. Um, So lots of people were starting them. That's double, by the way, what there was initially. There was like a million pre-COVID, two million posts. So a lot of people started pods. Mm -hmm. Um, And I had my own show, so I knew how to do like the actual marketing, promotion, production. Uh, And so... I started doing that for more of my clients. Uh, Indie Bites did come after. I was still sort of freelancing. And then Podpanda, the service, came after Indie Bites, like the actual product size service. Uh-huh. Less freelancing, more this is a service that I offer yeah. where I outsource some of the bits yeah. to. So people can go on a website, buy yeah, the yeah, edit, yeah. Uh, low touch e commerce type thing. Yeah. Do you do any of, um, do, do you work? also on distribution or, or growth or marketing of podcasts or is that something that you also you do like a freelance type of work on that subject or is that just something that you don't get involved i don't much? get involved that much um because i, I want to focus on making the content as good as it is and I, i'm a one-person yeah. agency much like brett is uh, and i feel like a lot of people when they're starting out um I, I want them to focus on making the content the best it can be a bit like a product, right? Yeah. If your product is not yeah, good yeah, yeah. and in a podcast case, if your podcast is not good, people won't listen. So if you're shoving it into more people or you're really focusing on distribution, you've got great distribution, right? Um, but your product is rubbish. Your podcast is rubbish. Uh, I'd rather make sure the content's really good. That being said, uh, if, the I, I think after about 10 episodes you can be sure that your content's good if i've helped you produce it and um, from that point we go right uh, how have we used our existing channels um to tell people that we started a pod uh, if it's for businesses we can use their email list their social media same for individuals to be honest um and uh, we'll look at how we can use those um uh, if the growth isn't so good uh we'll start uh like it, it's in my interest to help the podcast grow because if it doesn't then they might not continue it so from there you'll look at okay how else can we either create distribution channels for the pod maybe it's social maybe it's tiktok um maybe we're posting full youtube clips i know you do full youtube videos have you experimented with doing clips for the pod <laughs> Yes, we have. And I personally think that that's probably our biggest opportunity yeah. right now. I'm, I'm wondering what you're seeing, but um, I see that subscribers on YouTube are just generally not worth that much. I see accounts with millions of yeah. subscribers and they get 10,000 organic views on their videos. Um, while then you have accounts that are relatively small in terms of subscribers, but they just do clips or shorts and they get loads of loads of views there. So I think what's happening is YouTube is trying to compete with TikTok and I think they're pushing, they're massively pushing their shorts. And I think that that's probably where there's a big opportunity right now, both shorts, but on, on TikTok as well. I think TikTok is also still a, a good platform if you want to get your your content out there. But I'm, I'm curious what you're what you're seeing or what you think works yeah, well right now. Yeah, absolutely that. Like if you think about it with a, as a funnel, um, if people are consuming a lot of podcast content in short bites, on TikTok, on YouTube Shorts, on Instagram Reels, and that is taking video recordings of a pod, adding subtitles to it, taking a really interesting clip and putting it on social. Mm. Um, uh, maybe it's really poignant, maybe it's really interesting or helpful, insightful, and they're building up their short form video channels that way. Uh, your point about subscribers not being that valuable, yes, do agree now. Um, it's all about playing the algorithms and trying to get as many views and engagement on one particular short video and then trying to drive them into subscribing to the podcast in the podcast apps because people are listening to them uh, as part of their routine. Yeah. So they'll if you yeah. release on a specific day, do you release on this episode, uh, this pod on a specific day? 
Yeah, so it typically goes out on Tuesdays unless we got yeah, some fine, yeah. problem. So <laughs> every Tuesday, people know the Founders Lounge is coming out. Um, so they'll sort of bake it into yeah. their routine in general. Um, and once you have a listener, if you make sure you keep that content up, people will keep coming back. Um, my first million is the greatest example of this. Their popularity is shot up. Big inspiration. The content is so good. Yeah. And it's funny, before you were asking me about business ideas, uh, I'm comparing myself to my first million. It's just a melting pot of amazing business ideas out of that pod. Um, mm. But they do the clips. Mm. They've actually outsourced the clips to a competition, which I thought was such a clever idea, um, getting so many people to make clips with a cash prize at the end. Yeah. So that's helped them blow up that yeah. way. Um, but yeah, yeah, TikTok, TikTok clips, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels are the way to go. There's a new way to go with the growth of podcasts. The only trouble is it is so difficult to do. It is so much time and editing effort or money mm. if you pay someone else to do that. And if you want your clips to be really good, so nicely produced, maybe you've got some graphics on that, then it gets bloody expensive. Mm -hmm. That's that's something that we're going to experiment a little bit more with at the moment. Um, we, yeah, we tried a little bit of TikTok and we tried a little bit of shorts on YouTube, but um, there's more that we can do just to see how it, yeah, how it goes. Yeah, and, it, and where it's that like takes a commitment us. as well because you can't just do a week and if it doesn't work, uh, like what what is working really but if it doesn't hit your expectations you can't just stop you've got to go for a couple of months did you hear that producer tom mm -hmm. <laughs> did you hear that yeah. producer tom <laughs> producer tom i'm <laughs> giving you a bunch more work uh, but it, it's like uh, uh, make sure you charge a lot for this because it is a lot of work to uh, pump out this content uh, it, it takes a couple of months for your content starts surfacing and maybe it's only one that works out and those pods that have been really successful on tiktok uh, are ones that are pumping out like three four posts a day um and like figuring out what content works and they're landing in people's for you pages all the time um what are what are the pods that you say are a good inspiration right now so obviously you mentioned my first million i think they're excellent i think they're i mean their content is great their guests are great but also they i think it's just the dynamic between the two hosts is exceptionally good and that helps them create really good content but yeah they're they're world-class po uh, podcast at the moment but i'm curious if you have any other examples i had so uh in the previous episode, my guest was Dan Murray Surter, yeah, who has yeah, a yeah. very successful podcast himself, right? He's the number one business podcast Super in the UK leaders. right now. And I asked him that same question, or I asked him a question, I was like, well, and he just recently published that they made a million dollars in revenue with his podcast and I think the business around it. And I said, okay, so if I want to do the same, what should I do? Just just mm. tell me what to do and I'll do it. And I said, well, I can't really tell you what to do because we started this yeah. six years ago and there was way less competition. It was a completely different landscape. So he said, well, you need to ask somebody who's been really successful in the last year or so. So, but now I'm looking for good examples, who to ask or, <laughs> or who to look up I'm to. I'm trying to scroll through my feed because the one that comes into my mind is um, Stephen Bartlett, Diary of a CEO. Um, oh, yeah. He does a yeah. great job of packaging up these little clips. He's uh, Stephen Bartlett, also exceptionally good interviewer, um, gets really good guests. Yeah, his content. He's, I think he's really um, good at producing very emotional yeah. content that's relatable to for everyone. And so people watch that and it's, uh, yeah, he's, he's a marketing genius, right? He's a, an extremely good marketer. And that, I think that really shows as well, because he's good at just producing content in such a way that probably most of it goes viral, or at least it gets a really, really good reach. The other one I'll mention then, um, and this comes up actually on my Facebook page, like watch thing all the time, is this pod called the happy hour pod. And it's, uh, Oh. that it, it's like born out of the side men on youtube and these guys have done such an amazing job at taking their content from what it was in youtube seven years ago to like podcast uh, membership content actually well-produced shows um for their audience but this happy hour pod uh it's like <laughs> it's it's pretty much nonsense right but it's <laughs> it's entertaining um so like you hear these stories uh -huh. from 
OnlyFans models or people in, you know, like celebrities or B-list celebrities. Um, yeah. And it, it's very entertaining. And they, they're a good example of clips. That's it. That's a very good point that you bring up as well. I think most podcasts or, or I, I think a good factor for success is if your podcast is entertaining mm -hmm. to some extent, because it's not, it shouldn't be just 100%. educational. It should be entertaining. I think most people consume podcasts because they want to, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. You, if you want it to be just educational, then you go and listen to an ebook, right? But podcast is like, okay, I'm relaxing, but I'm also learning something maybe at the same time. Absolutely. So it's a different it, mindset. The, that the entertainment in. thing is so overlooked. Like you are competing against comedians with podcasts, true crime podcasts. You're competing mm. against Netflix. Like how are people spending their time? You're competing against music. Uh, you compete against audiobooks. So like having some sort of entertainment, um, entertainment value or like pacing of the show. I do a 15 minute pod because... I feel like I, I want to keep the pace up. So I often do like 45 uh -huh. minute hour long conversations and then it's edited down into the best 15 uh, minutes. So I keep okay. the pace up of the conversation. Yeah. So there's no fluff in there. Like if I was editing this podcast yeah, yeah, back, yeah. I can think of a few times where I've maybe not um, said exactly what I meant or uh, I've repeated the same thing. I'll just cut all that out and yeah. cut it down to this 15 minute uh -huh. show. And I think people that are starting a pod and they're wondering, oh, it's a lot of time doing these hour-long interviews. There's loads of people with hour-long interviews. Just do a 10-minute interview show. Like, barely any people have that. Mm. A lot of people have lost their commute. So when they're listening to a new podcast, they're going to struggle to, like, commit an hour to listen to a new one. Whereas if they've got, like, a 10-minute show, they go, oh, I'll give that a go when I'm doing the dishes, when I'm going out for a walk. In fact, I'll line up three in a row and I'll listen to those. And it reduces your time on production because you can do a really good interview show in 10 minutes. Um, like we think of stories on YouTube, like you can tell a really good story in 10 minutes. Uh, you think of TikToks that can tell a story in uh, 60, yeah. 30 seconds. Uh, you think of Vines that could tell a story in seven seconds. Um, so like 10 minutes is still plenty of time. That's how, so I think one of the first people started doing that was... Uh... It's called 15 VC, 15 minute VC, VC yeah. right? Harry, the uh, 20 minute VC, yeah, that's right. And he's, he, Harry started doing that years he's ago. He's lost his edge because he's and... no longer doing 20 minute episodes. They're all long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the, the thing that he named yeah, the show after, which was its uh, <laughs> value prop, is now gone. Um, but like yeah. Yeah, his audience is big enough now, and so he can probably get away with it. So, but if you want to start a VC podcast, just do a 15 minute VC or 10 minute VC and like fill that gap that yeah, Harry exactly, created yeah. and then has <laughs> now left. The attention span is getting shorter. So if anything, you need to go shorter, not longer, right? <laughs> um, I was going to ask you one more thing. So you, you brought up a book before, um, one person company business, one, I yeah. think. Um, uh, yeah. The company of one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's another one with a similar, ta uh, similar title. I think it's one what million dollar one person business I, I got confused a little bit what's the company of one uh as a book is that would you say that that's one of the most influential books yeah that you've there's read? uh like three books that have been super influential for me company of one uh it's basically changing your mindset from growth at all costs it's written by a chap called paul jarvis um he runs a company called fathom now um analytic software and uh, it, it was just like you've got to question growth and it was a bunch of really cool examples of uh, basically indie hackers people who um, didn't raise money and are wanting to build a business for a better life for themselves or uh, like uh, optimizing for freedom and that for me is really important and that changed my mindset from wanting to go on this big marketing career and then start a VC funded business to actually I want um, some more freedom in my life so that was one book then there was Shoe Dog uh, Phil Knight, memoir of the founder of Nike. I thought that was just such, it, it read like a um, novel. It was fascinating with a bunch of business lessons in it. So it was like a novel, a business novel, thoroughly enjoyable, complete page turner. I've given that book to so many different people. Um, what else? Uh, I really enjoyed Anything You Want by Derek Sivers. Uh, the, the, oh, it's yeah. a short book. You can read it in an hour and a bit. Uh, and it was just different views on business. Like uh, Derek, like has nothing to prove. He's nothing to sell you. 
I, I got 10 of his books for free. Um, like if you want one, I can send you one. Eric is great, yeah. Have you read it? Um, I have not read this one. I've read his latest one. Uh, what is it? Yeah, 27 I thought that was rubbish. Ways to Live Life or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was just... Uh, I, I read it on a flight home, I think. I was like, okay, something... Um, interesting it, to be occupied it with it annoyed but, me um, because like it, it does what it says it's like 27 conflicting ideas and it was really confusing because they very mm -hmm. much were conflicting he'd say one thing in one chapter and then contradicts it completely in the next and yes. that really like, it annoyed me and it was probably because what, what, uh, <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> no, i i love it. he's like he's famous for being yeah. super simplistic right like everything he does is extremely sim simplified but it bothered me in this book because I was like, I just wish you would expand on that sentence a little bit more because it's conflicting with the previous sentence and now I don't actually know what you meant with that. <laughs> yeah. But you're saying that the... Uh, what is his, his other book? That that one's really good. Uh, anything you want. Anything you want. Yeah, that's right. I yeah. don't know where I put them. I have like six more of them. I will send you one if you send me a dress after. And have a little read. Um, All right. There's awesome. one more I'll mention, and that's Essentialism with Greg McGowan. I really enjoyed that. That was just uh, like a, another different approach. Oh, there's one more. Sorry, five book recommendations for you. And then Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. That that was oh, that it. really changed uh, my approach to like, uh, this is when I was really feeling down as well. And I was like, putting up obstacles yeah. for myself. And it was like, how can you use these obstacles, yeah. like things that you think are in front of you and uh, spin them for your advantage? Yeah, well, for me, probably one of the most stressful moments, stressful moments of my life, well, or periods of my life, was when I was running a, a, a startup that was also we raised some funding. There was a lot of pressure. It was a completely new thing for me. I had no idea what I was doing. The whole fact that we raised funding felt very. I was very uncomfortable with that at the time, and that just made it way more stressful for me. And the uh, uh, the obstacle is the way helped me so much reading that i would just whenever i had a tough day i just read a few chapters or a few pages from that book and i just yeah. i just felt better after reading that so it's an exceptionally good book yeah especially if you're um in a stressful situation but in general i think just as a mindset to understand and to adopt cool um was there anything else that we should talk about? No, uh, you don't. I thought this up? was a very enjoyable interview. Um, we sort of meandered around a few topics. I'm pleased we touched on mental health and sort of freedom and my approach to business, a little bit on pop pop podcasting. So yeah, I enjoyed it. Nice. Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much again for coming on and uh, good luck with your Thank you, your man. Business. You too with this podcast. Uh, I love the idea of the Founders Lounge of like... Uh, I like some vibey music and people chilling out and founders having a chat because that is my favorite thing to do in the world. It's like just chilling and chatting with my friends. Uh, you should come along to Indie Beers. Uh, every every last oh, Wednesday yeah. of the month, we go to a pub in Shoreditch and we have some beers and uh, chat about our businesses. It's good fun. I will look that up. Indiebeers.co.uk. Yeah. Found it. Perfect. All right. Well, gonna Amazing. wrap up. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Matisse. Thanks for listening until the end. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like the content, please do me a favor and click the like button on YouTube or give us five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever it is that you listen to your podcasts. Uh, leave a comment, subscribe if you want to hear more from us. Uh, that really helps also to get the podcast out there and that helps me get more interesting guests and create even more interesting content. So. I really appreciate it if you do that. If you have any other comments, questions, feel free to message me. You can find me on Twitter. That's usually the best channel. Um, the link should be somewhere in the description. And uh, yeah, check out my Twitter. I try to tweet interesting stuff about similar content that we talk about on the podcast. Um, key insights from the podcast as well. And just generally stuff that I learn and stuff that I do. So see you. Thanks.